This is a kind of really uh, kind of interesting topic, and, and so I presume it's a, a, like a, there's dual language kind of pieces going on, or there's ESL pieces. Um, and this is a kind of common finding, I think, that's emerging in, in kind of educational learning science at, at neuroscience, is that a lot of times there are kind of fits and stops and starts um, as kids are kind of dealing with like navigating two languages. Um, and this is actually like fairly common where um, many people have found kind of bits of drop off. And basically you can think about, you're kind of asking kids to learn more skills. Um, learning a language is actually like a really tough thing. And so you're kind of, and kids are still getting the nuances of language even in the ages you're talking about. And so you're actually, you're asking kids to learn two languages, do some like complex code switching, and then like learn educational content. And so my kind of general take home I think with it is we're asking kids to do a lot. We're asking them to do more than kind of their single language kind of counterparts. And so what happens is a lot of times there's a little bit of a delay or lag, but there's often kind of, I think outcomes generally kind of equalize in the end and the kids come up being you know bilingual. Um, so that's the pattern I think that I've seen from the data is generally we're asking these kids to do more and their language, ex you're asking them to kind of navigate through two languages and this is a lot kind of going on there. Um, but for the most part, in the longer term outcomes, things seem mostly positive and that itself doesn't have a kind of, there are kind of challenges at different points in development because of the kind of lags and trajectories of what's going on. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I think that um, we can always just know that uh, trauma is bad and that's going to cause, uh, you don't need a brain scanner to do it, to understand that or to know that. Um, there are ways to grow from trauma, uh, but you have to be, I think, very intentional about it and there's a lot of work and hardship with it. It's, it's not an easy process to kind of make it through the other side uh, for many people. Um, so I think that we know trauma is bad and that's impacting a lot of kind of biobehavioral outcomes, neurobiological outcomes, things like that. And then I think on top of this, you're almost kind of asking them to do kind of more. And so that's where um, it can be particularly challenging and harrowing because you're gonna have these natural kind of lags and gaps because of bilingualism and dual language immersion kind of pieces. And then you're gonna have kind of trauma kind of bouncing those things down too. Um, so it, it, it is particularly like, harrowing in that regard. But I would say that as people can kind of, I think, uh, try to think about ways to make sense of that horrible kind of, you know, social structure being pulled away and broken up. Um, that's where I think, like, you know, educators can have some power, some movement, is trying to think about kind of, you know, engaging with their kids about this challenge and what the hell they're feeling and, like, what the hell they just are seeing in their communities with people kind of getting pulled out and, um, feeling unsafe and unsturdy. And I think similar to trauma, having lots of kind of instability is again, not a positive thing for kids. And so again, these kind of, um, a lot of the family separation pieces are kind of really problematic from, a, from science and policy side. We know it's not good for families, so yeah. Um, we see it in the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex um, in non-human animals, um, and the volumetric loss is, is um, in humans is, is, is comparable. Like we see kind of lower volumes in both structural volumes in the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus for um, uh, low SES kids. So, so I do not have brain data, but we have uh, behavioral data, and I think that can kind of speak to it. And so I think, again, this idea of, of role models and support and kind of changing the context um, uh, into a, to a positive place, uh, you know, just fosters better development. Like, we kind of know that. Like, I think we have, like, a kind of pretty clear sense. We can, we may, excuse me, soon find kind of neural signatures of that, but I think we kind of know it from a bio, like a bio, like a behavioral side. Yeah, and I, I think about the kind of the psychological challenges that are sometimes created by these experiences, and know, that's where you can have kind of um, can different kind of challenges. I, I think about, I saw some lots of, lots of video with this family separation kind of pieces, and kids just like already just feeling horribly unattached from their parents, and that's a kind of a place where um, sometimes you can really hit people at their bedrock, and then like the, the, the effects are just kind of have a continued aftermath. Um, 
But I, I think in terms of kind of moving to a positive school setting, I think that that definitely kind of is a place where, you know, that's going to bolster kind of kids' capacities and also um, allow them to kind of gain more role models, feel safe. And so I think it's giving them more context to feel safe in is, the, is, a, is a critical piece anywhere. Like it does, like schools are one place, but there are multiple places. That, and I think the more we can increase kids feeling safe and secure, that's going to just, again, foster development. So. So the questions or the comment was really all about kind of Stockton, who I think you guys are also doing like a basic universal income, aren't you? Your mayor's trying to pull that off. Yeah, there's, they're doing a pretty, there are a lot of progressive policies, um, but they have kind of sanctuary schools. Um, and I think <clears throat> to a lesser extent, uh, Pittsburgh has this notion of uh, community schools and basically thinking about uh, schools as a kind of community resource. And so even things like having the school, if you can kind of get it past litigation and deal with the legal kind of stuff from a like superintendent, district, principal kind of piece, but like even just having like, uh, you know, your, your gyms open longer and like kids can have a space that they run around in because maybe they like, you know, there's a kind of playground down the street, but it's like, you know, people are hanging out there and, the, and families don't always maybe feel so great or safe. And so just having different spaces that I think can enrich kids' lives and trying to leverage the resources that schools have. Um, you know, I always feel uh, bad kind of putting, I feel like teachers are forced to do everything at this point. They're, 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 they're forced to do a lot in terms of be social workers, nurses, mental health professionals. Um, and I, I worry that we just keep putting more stuff on you and we need to actually kind of develop uh, community resources uh, in, in a real way, um, not just kind of keep tossing it to you guys. So. Um, so one question was about the kind of time scale. I'm not 100% sure, and I won't speak because I'm uh, to that because I'm not 100. I, I don't know the research on that ex extremely well, but I do know that we do see like often long lasting effects. And you know, on some level, it might be that you still just kind of get to a average level, like your stress is pushing you down, but your 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 enrichment is pushing you back up, and that would be kind of my initial kind of guess where you might just kind of you know kind of average everything out, but that's still maybe better than if you were just stress exposed and didn't have any kind of enrichment. Um, people have tried to do these kind of reversal studies or kind of do these different things, and some, some parts of the brain and some of these dendritic uh, arbors kind of do show this kind of plasticity and kind of uh, alterations over time. Um, in terms of kind of the types of enrichment, um, I always think about kind of continually, well, there's a couple pieces. So um, uh, uh, obviously, you know, you guys, it makes most sense. There's kind of lots of kind of pedagogical pieces and cognitive kind of elements of things. Um, we, we don't often think about physical enrichment is, is incredibly great. Uh, running, similarly, uh, so there's like, you can get these cool cages with these rats. Uh, if you just have the rats run a bunch more, their brain changes. Physical exercise is incredibly helpful. It's a great antidepressant. It's something that we should all be moving more, but we sit, we sit sedentary under, under lights a lot. Um, and I think a lot about how kids and their physical bodies are kind of pushed, are, are, are not moving. Um, and that can be a place where I think that there could be some kind of interesting things. Um, and, and then I would say the, the broader idea of even the cognitive enrichment and kind of pedagogy would be anything that uh, kids find rewarding, I think that like, and they're excited about. I think the biggest thing is if you can harness people's passion and make it culturally relevant, there's kind of this, you know, culturally relevant, culturally sensitive pedagogy, and I think about Gloria Lutz and Billings and all that kind of, that kind of piece. Um, but I think what, if, if kids get excited about what they want to do, that's really going to get them kind of working independently and just excited and kind of continually kind of running back to it. Um, and I think that's a powerful thing. If you can, you know, have places where you let kind of kids decide and I have a friend who runs a sh uh, kind of what she calls a free school or a, a kind of more like very progressive school in um, Chicago and they have kind of like kids decide almost choose your own adventure elements of curriculum. So there's a lot of kind of pieces to unpack there. So the idea on some level, if you have kind of suspension prohibitions, you may have kids that, you know, actually have disciplinary issues that, you know, need to be attended to, but uh, if, you, if you prohibit suspensions or limit them, then you may have just kind of a lot of challenges of, of chaos in a classroom. I think there's also the kind of notion of like the school to prison pipeline, disproportionate suspensions of young black boys. Um, so that's kind of, I think, a, a piece just to hold in mind. Um, but one thing that I just wanted to share kind of a community-based anecdote um, with a community group I, I work with in, in Pittsburgh called Project Destiny, who's led, led by a really powerful, uh, charismatic reverend named Brenda Gregg. Um, and Reverend Gregg was telling me recently there was a 
number of kids who were kind of uh, pushed out of, um, I wouldn't say pushed out, but they were suspended from a couple of Pittsburgh public schools for pretty significant offenses. Um, but Reverend Gregg is this kind of powerful community leader. She is you know, reverend and just kind of speaks with this like kind of intense like passion of the black clergy. Um, and uh, the kids actually kind of went to her. She runs an after school program called Project Destiny. She went to PD and um, Project Destiny and, and kind of was working with the kids. And the kids almost ex exhibited like limited to no behavioral problems. Like, um, so I was gonna say one thing, if you can kind of get it past the admin folks in your world, um, is thinking about kind of uh, harnessing the power of community and community leaders um, that kids might respect and think highly of um, to kind of deal with disciplinary challenges. Because um, sometimes, you know, there are people who uh, kids respect and think really highly of, and if they say knock it off, it may kind of carry some different weight than um, you and your other uh, teachers. But that's kind of, so, so I think it's a, it's a hard balance to strike, um, but one kind of alternative path is trying to think about kind of leveraging kind of community-based role models um, in different ways. Um, and you know, I think about, there's a couple programs happening in, uh, by Johns Hopkins where they're doing kind of this like elder, senior kind of um, senior care thing where they, they have folks um, kind of as uh, senior citizens who are retired kind of come in as classroom aides. Um, and they found that it's kind of highly beneficial for both the kids and the seniors. The seniors have lower risk of Alzheimer's and dementia and some, I think some data I saw. And then the kids often kind of have these interesting kind of community role models. And so it's a kind of a third way, because I think there is this kind of debate right now, and Pittsburgh was trying to prohibit suspensions from zero to, uh, or from K to five. Um, and there's lots of kind of, uh, I think, important progressive champions kind of noting the challenges with over suspension, but I think you're, you're right to say that under suspension can often cause some challenges too. Yeah. Yep, um, and um, to kind of really like draw a lot of like things together, to put a lot of bows on a lot of things, um, there's a lot of kind of interesting pedagogical techniques that I think uh, often uh, leverage physical movement. So my wife has um, become, she's a PhD in ed, and she um, has been doing a lot of work on what's called theater of the oppressed, um, which is a pedagogical technique that kind of allows kids to kind of act out and move and kind of understand um, exclusion and often kind of prejudice and bias. Um, and so there's things like that, that if you really want to also think about kind of um, inequities and trauma, thinking about kind of packaging all these things to physical movement can be good. Doing any kind of physical movement, I think, can be good. Um, get, let kids to kind of get out their energies, but then also trying to think about, well, there's only so much time in the day and kids just had this kind of challenge and trauma. So try to almost do all these, you know, if we only have so many thing, times in the day to try to package a bunch of things together. Um, yeah. It's called Theater of the Oppressed. Um, it, there's a couple different professional organizations that kind of talk about it, but they do kind of different kinds of role playing um, in um, school settings. My wife was just in a, what's called the Allegheny Intermediate Unit, and it's kind of a secondary placement for kids who were um, suspended um, or expelled in other settings. And it was kids who are, you know, have some disciplinary challenges, and they at least kind of gave kids some space to kind of talk about where they are and what's happening in their lives. Yeah, I mean, this is a challenge, and I think this is, there's a lot of kind of work on this, the school to prison pipeline kind of piece where kids are getting disengaged because they're getting suspended, and then it just comes harder to kind of check back into school, and then when you're suspended, you're like, I'm already a week behind, why do I care? And it's, 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 it's one step easier to kind of get out the door, um, and I think there's a lot of kind of concerns from racial equity to think about that kind of piece of thing. So we had kind of a ex, ex, pretty, uh, you know, level three expert style question in terms of um, someone asking about this thing called brain-derived neurotrophin factor, which is a, a molecule that's really involved and implicated in a lot of elements of plasticity. Um, so the short answer is no. Uh, um, there's a huge uh, challenge, uh, I think, right now in the neuroscience is, is trying to think about how to measure those things. We used to do what were called candidate gene work, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. We use a little tiny snip of your, of your DNA and we look like you have the, the good snip and you have the bad snip. Um, but we're, we're starting to realize that work is, is a little short-sighted and, and limited, I think, in its uh, replicability. Um, and the genome functions as a more complex kind of holistic unit. Um, so we're still, I think, thinking about kind of um, what would be called, they're called polygenic scores of plasticity. Um, but 
I, I do not do that work, and there's still like work, I think. There's a lot of work to be done, but basically there are probably individual variations in, ha in our neurochemistry that could be, uh, you know, or just there in general, and that may explain some elements of resiliency, and then could be augmented to potentially kind of influence and increase um, some positive effects. Um, and so uh, I'm not sure how to do that, but I think it is a promising and important kind of avenue. So, yeah. Yeah, no, and I, uh, I think this is a, a kind of really important thing, and it's something I kind of go back to so often, which is I think we want to underscore the gravity and the importance and the difficulties conveyed by these experiences, but not make it so depressing and demoralizing. And I'm still trying to think of how to strike this kind of appropriate uh, kind of uh, balance um, and appropriate tone. Um, but I, I think you're, you're dead on. Um, and I, I, I struggle a lot with um, the bootstrappery and grit kind of stuff and you know, you're just pull yourself up and all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, there are people who survive and there are people who are making it. Um, but I think about what if we had fostered, what if their development had been fostered and supported? Yeah, someone is, has risen out of some difficult circumstance, but you know, if we had you know, nipped or lessened the impact of those difficult circumstances early on, that person could have been, you know, who knows, the next Steve Jobs, the next pick your favorite person. And I think there's this kind of sometimes simplistic notion of local well, XYZ person made it and here's this great story. Um, and that is, that's important to highlight, but I think it's really about kind of fostering the development of all people. And I, I also think from a, a policy side, I talk with lots of people from across the political perspective, it just actually makes economic sense to support families and kids at the margins. And I kind of think the, um, the country level, the countries who figure out how to do this effectively and well will just win the 21st century. China has so many people. If they can figure out a way to kind of effectively and economically feasibly foster their development, it's over. The US will be like, the US will not be able to economically compete. And that on some level, I, you clearly probably know where my political beliefs are, but uh, I think about friends on the other side of the aisle, and that has to feel like a compelling policy argument. And there are people who have to realize that like, we have to think about collective kind of well-being from a societal perspective, and again, think about fostering this development and not just about surviving and making it through. So yeah, thank you for sharing. Relations are critical, we kind of know this. And I, um, again, my wife is an uh, education PhD, and um, so I just steal a lot of things that she tells me that sound very smart. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, she kind of cued me to this idea of a warm demander, um, where you have expectations, but you're warm and kind of uh, flexible and kind of meets the kid, kids where they're at. And I think about there's so many different kind of beautiful kind of education case studies. I think about Gloria Lipton Billings a lot, but um, that kind of work that can kind of get it these ideas of, of, of dealing with challenging kids. Kids are challenging because it's, it's hard. Um, uh, but kind of meeting kids where they're at and trying to kind of uh, be this kind of unflappable relationship can be a powerful thing for kids. We know that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just like take an editorial point and say I, I dislike the notion of grit in general. Um, I think lots of kids living in low SES contexts are already gritty enough and survived enough. Um, and there's a nice framework actually from some of the folks that I highlighted right at the end, uh, Edith Miller and Greg Chen at Northwestern University, um, talk about the concept of what they call shift and persist. And I think it's a much more interesting idea. Um, and you can think about grit is great, except if all the odds are, and circumstances are stacked against you, it makes no sense to persist. It doesn't help you, you're just banging your head against the wall. And there's beautiful psychological work kind of showing that. Like they have this you know, old work from the 60s about learned helplessness where these dogs were unable to escape you know, shocks. And there's a point where you just give up. It doesn't matter that the dogs are gritty for a little bit. If you can't get away, if you can't deal, if you can't you know, make it through that, it's, it's pointless and you're actually gonna maybe do yourself psychological harm. 
Um, and, and Miller and Chen argue that there's a persist element, which is related to the kind of grit, but there's also this shift and kind of changing and altering perspectives, thinking about kind of different priorities that you might take on. And I think it's this, this notion of, of kind of having both of those things is incredibly important. Um, but also I think, also in your comment, sometimes we may not uh, have high enough expectations with kids and they can actually do a lot of stuff, but we maybe over empathize with them. Not that I know of right away off the top of my head, but um, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, uh, to again, take a little bit of an editorial perspective, I think the notion of like high stakes testing is incredibly counterproductive. Um, and so like, I don't know why we do it. Uh, I do not control any policy, but it's something that like, this is not the way that we, we know from a basic psychological perspective that this is not the best way to learn and the best way to test and assess is not to like, put all this pressure on people and then like say like, okay, just, you know, kill and drill, dump it back out. Um, so, so I do get, I, I struggle sometimes because I think that we have to be more thoughtful about the ways that we're assessing uh, knowledge um, and um, we can do that through multiple means and methods. And so I, I wish that we'd move towards that, but that's very unlikely and a little too Pollyannish. 